about uh, the, the toolkit that the um, Clean Energy District has for us, um, to hear more about how this has worked really well in Winchester County. And um, so we will um, defer to our panelists here in just a minute, but Rachel, if you want to kind of get us up to speed with some of the sustainability efforts going on here, that would be awesome. Um, so I'm really excited to actually recognize quite a few and, and then meet some wonderful new people. Um, so Mount Mercy, we're um, part, uh, working through a sustainability grant right now, and a lot of that does um, include different sustainability initiatives on campus, and then also pairing that, um, try and pair that well with our curriculum, so increasing sustainability awareness within our curriculum. Um, we just did a, kind of a run through of our course catalog. We do have a lot of sustainability already in our courses, um, but maybe our faculty don't realize they're teaching sustainability, so also, and our students don't realize they're learning about it. Um, so just raising the awareness of that um, is a big key, and then increasing it where we can. Um, but we are working on reducing our carbon footprint by decreasing our uh, electrical usage. A lot of that is LED light conversions. We have a lot of good potential yet um, in some of our buildings. Um, reducing our stormwater impact is another big one for here because Cedar Rapids, right on the river, we all know the story of the 2008 flood. Um, so trying to reduce our impact that way too. Um, uh, another passion of mine that we've been working on with our groundskeepers is increasing native um, plants in the biodiversity of our campus, um, which will also help to reduce our water usage hopefully in the future. Uh, so just, just kind of a snapshot of what we're doing. So um, our two main pillars is kind of uh, reducing waste and reducing our impacts and increasing awareness of our education. So um, we're very excited to kind of learn more about this and see if it's something that would be beneficial for Mount Mercy to be a part of. Hello everyone, um, my name is Eli Fraley. I'm the Outreach Coordinator with uh, Green Iowa AmeriCorps here in uh, Cedar Rapids. And I'm happy to inter be introducing our panelists. We have uh, Jolene Jansen, who um, she has her own business, Jolene Products, but she's also been working with the, uh, need to pull up, sorry. Right. She works with the Clean Energy Districts of Iowa. And we have Greg Mosher, um, He's a founding member of the Winnishek Energy District, and he's been uh, working with sustainability efforts at Luther College for uh, several years. And he's also, he's currently in Iowa City, but he's currently helping create energy districts in Johnson and Lynn County. And finally, we have Andy Johnson. He is the founding director of the Winnishek Energy District in the Cora, where he's been working there since its inception 10 years ago. And he's also the director of the State Association, Clean Energy Districts of Iowa. So thank you all so much for coming and talking about energy districts here in Iowa County, and I'll hand it off to y'all. Thanks, Eli. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks, and hello, and do we need this? Is this on? Hello? Yes. Does it help? Yeah. Okay. And so I'm going to try and give a brief history of what we've done in Winnesheek and, and the model that we've tried to develop and, and is, is replicating somewhat rapidly here in eastern Iowa in about 10 minutes. So <laughs> that's a long story. And uh, so I'm going to be glossing over a lot of things. Feel free to jump in if there's something urgent that is a question that arises, but I think we're hoping to have quite a bit of time for discussion as we go forward. So, um, so from coffee conversations to a theory of change, um, I have three kids. They all learned to read with, with Dr. Seuss. And there's a lot of wisdom there. Um, but we really did start Winnesheek Energy District uh, over coffee conversations um, at Luther College when Craig was there and some other folks involved. Um, Decorah is not that large a community, of course. Um, so that's a little bit of a different setting maybe than, a, than an area like Cedar Rapids, but uh, the idea really was um, similar to what we're seeing as replication happens, and that is that there are champions for clean energy transition everywhere um, coming at it from different angles. There are two big, are two big green meets green philosophy pieces of the economics of clean energy, um, the positive economic impacts that every community can feel, and of course the stewardship and 
imperatives um, were both there from the very beginning. And so we had a, a local bank owner and we had college faculty. We had myself as a conservationist and a farmer actually, still am, and, and we, had other, we had a philosopher. You know, so we, we had quite a diversity of folks actually talking about essentially you know, how are we going to do this, how can we move our entire community and region towards clean energy, not beyond just our individual actions, and beyond the existing institutions, which I think is important. Um, because, yes, we have city governments, and we have planning organizations, and we have nonprofits in all of our communities. Um, but essentially what we, what we found and determined and realized was there is no institution, really, or organization, um, at least on a universal scale, and there certainly wasn't to Decorah, specifically tasked with this really major challenge and opportunity of moving towards clean energy quickly, and locally owned clean energy as much as possible. And so we developed as we went along what, what I refer to here as the theory of change um, for energy districts, at least some pieces of it um, that have guided some of our work. It, society does change slowly. We, that's, that's easy enough for us all to get. Um, and so to change a little quicker than necessary is hard and it takes intentional effort. And many of us are involved in many different things um, in our lives and communities. We can't outsource it all to policymakers, and that goes for whether they're local or state or federal policy makers. Um, we have this fixation in our country, I think, with big laws. And we certainly see it right now this time of year and this time of the, of the political cycle for sure. And those policies and proposals are important, but you can have the best policies in the world, and if they're not enacted or implemented, they're not going to do any good. You can also have great policies and yet still be lacking. And so what we've seen actually is we have had some really good clean energy policies, believe it or not. And in Iowa, we have an example of that with our energy efficiency programs. We have had some of the largest, well-funded, um, long-term energy efficiency programs in any state in the country, where we were the, one of the very first, all the way back in 1989 or so, to implement ratepayer-funded energy efficiency programs. And we have put more money into those programs per capita than any other state in the country um, without stellar results, I should say. We'll just leave it at that. Um, they've had impacts for sure, but we've also had dramatically um, significant missing links, missing pieces. And some of those are boots on the ground, local implementers, non-utility implementers. Um, so institutions, getting to the third point here, institutions really do work. They can work when they're tasked with appropriate missions and they have champions to back them up and resources to back them up. Um, those champions exist everywhere. We do need to find resources. That's a key part of this conversation for energy districts. Um, we have a model. There are obviously champions everywhere. We have made some real impacts in Winnesheek and in other, some other counties, uh, but we do not have a universal uh, financial resource base at this point to fund energy districts everywhere. So that's, that's just something I'll say up front. And the last piece here that I wanted to mention is energy is complicated. It's a technical issue for many. Everyone essentially knows oh yeah, I could probably save a lot of money in my home or my farm or my business or my governmental entity or whatever it may be, my organization. Very few people have a really good idea how to get from A to B and C and D to E. And so that technical assistance is critical and you can provide quality technical assistance and that's a big part of what we've tried to focus on. It does cost money. So we've done it with grants. Um, we'll talk maybe here in this conversation about other opportunities for all energy districts to work together and partner with state and federal programs to do more technical assistance. But this is an important piece of what we do in energy districts. It's not just education and awareness. That's important, and that's what a lot of nonprofits do. We're trying to go well beyond that. And we need to mention that up front. So universal local. Um, local institutions are either general or specialized, of course. We have local governments, we have school systems, we have regional planning, councils of governments, cap agencies, a lot of local institutions. Um, some of them are much more broad-based, but we have many local institutions that are quite specialized. Soil and water conservation districts are that way, county conservation boards. We have these things that exist essentially in every county in Iowa and in many states across the country. So that's not a brand new idea. And what we're trying to say with energy districts, with the model, uh, we actually started with the soil and water conservation district model just because I had come out of that, that arena. Um, 
Many people are familiar with them, many are not. These days, some soil and water districts work, still do amazing work, and some just kind of plod along. But that's an old model, and we're not going to go have too much time to go into it right now, but it's a really fascinating model that actually grew out of the Dust Bowl in the Great Depression. And for the first many decades, <laughs> soil and water districts were extremely dynamic and active across the country. And in fact, they formed from zero to from, from not a single soil and water district in about 1935 to a soil and water district in every single county in the country in about a decade. So this was an amazing story of a, a universal local institution with a specific mission and task, a really big one, but specific, that really grew and, and, and has worked consistently for, for 70, 80 years. Energy, we feel, implementation of that locally owned clean energy transition has a similar opportunity. And so prosperity and stewardship, that's that green meets green message. Um, we all might have different language we like. I actually like to use a diversity of language. Um, the positive local economic impacts of clean energy can't be uh, overestimated, really. And it's not just something that we use to sort of say, to bring along the business community, <laughs> to pretend to be bipartisan, whatever it may be. This is a, a truly unique opportunity. Um, we've ban bantered numbers around and, and, and tried to prove this for a year in the ongoing Alliant Energy Rate case, where a ruling just came out recently. I don't know how many of you have followed that. Um, but supposedly a nice major reduction in what Alliant Energy is now charging Eastern Iowa customers still comes out to another $125 million a year extracted of wealth extracted from our ratepayers and communities into investors. And so that's just one little piece. But energy is a major, major drain on our communities and our economies. It's a major trade deficit, if you want to look, think about it that way. Sure, there's some local economic act activity driven by investor and utilities and driven by our energy infrastructure. But by and large, it's a huge trade deficit for almost every Iowa community and county. We can reverse that economic imbalance with local ownership of clean energy. In Winnesheet County alone, just the tip of the iceberg, but we've documented now about $14 million invested in locally owned efficiency in solar just through the work that we've been doing in the last eight to nine years. That's not a huge number for an economy, even maybe in Cedar Rapids, but for a Winnishi County economy, that's starting to reach into the percentages. And that's with minimal resources and, and capabilities compared to what we know is out there. And so again, acceleration when we, when we can create the resources and the institutions to lead this um, and really promote the local ownership of clean energy, we can accelerate that transition and we can own it. And that's a pretty dramatic impact. Climate stewardship obviously is a major part of this. I don't need to spend too much time on that, I assume. Um, we are all in it for both of those reasons. And then another key point here is the inclusivity of, of energy districts. We do try and work with all sectors of society. We do try and develop programs that especially focus on marginalized communities and low-income households. And uh, the Green Iowa AmeriCorps program, for example, we have a team of Green Iowa AmeriCorps volunteers. We have served over a thousand households. Just our Winnesheek Energy District, quote, team of Green Iowa AmeriCorps volunteers. Um, that's a big impact. It's a relatively small amount of dollars saved per household, but for each one of those households, it really matters, and it's a, it's a first step. In many cases, towards greater savings as well. So. so strategies and programs, of course, we could talk forever about what we do and how we do it. Um, this graphic comes from our Geography of Change document, where we try and explain the model. It's available online, but it's, it's about a 20-page document. Um, but, but this circle is what we call the flywheel of change because it's, it essentially is a, it's a momentum building process. We do a lot of education, we do a lot of engagement. Um, we also do a lot of that technical assistance I mentioned and try and put the two together to transform markets. So market transformation, I mentioned solar. Um, when we started, there was one solar contractor who was one person working in, in the area. Within about, and that was in 2010, before solar was economically viable at all. Um, 
the more technical assistance we did, especially with businesses, we realized this was the, really the opportunity, more so than household, early on. Because as we did significant energy efficiency projects with 50 businesses in downtown Decorah in the first two or three years, um, we realized some of these businesses were really interested potentially in renewables. And so we started, we got certified right away to do solar side assessments, and we started doing the economic analysis on solar and meshing that with our technical, with our energy efficiency technical analysis. And we started getting a little bit of uptake, a little bit of uptake in 12 and 13. By 2015, we had five solar contractors in the core. That was because, in part, we did the economic analysis that built the demand. We also worked together with the community college um, to say, hey, look, <laughs> we're seeing this opportunity, we're seeing this demand, there's no one here to do this, it should be local contractors. So they developed the coursework and our local electrical contractors, by and large, sent people to community college for continuing ed and got certified to implement solar panels. And then when you have contractors who see a market, they're going to sell the market, right? <laughs> But if these are established local contractors, they have an established broad base of customers already. This isn't some fly-by-night you know, new thing that someone sees a profit motive and comes and goes. These contractors are ready to get out there. And then we do the solar workshops and the solar tours. And this market now in Winnesheek, and in fact throughout much of Northeast Iowa, is really rolling. Our role at this point is just to kind of keep pushing that momentum <laughs> wheel, right? We do tours, we do workshops, we do a lot of information on we do a lot of work, actually, also on the policy arena to try and keep the option open because the utilities are always trying to shut that door um, on customer ownership. We'll talk more about that later, too. Um, but so that's just an example of this flywheel of momentum engaging in multiple levels in the community. A new energy district isn't necessarily going to do all of these things all at once. You can take the stepwise wherever there are people available and where there are resources available and then you know, potentially pursue grants to do, to do more, provide more services. So I'm just going to wrap this up. Probably already over my timing. Um, it's another simple Dr. Seuss quote. The picture up on top is my daughter when she was quite a little bit younger. But, uh, I should mention also that besides the energy work, I do still live on our family farm, and we manage, we manage the family farm. My wife and three girls and I, so plenty um, busy. Next, really. All right. <laughs> Are you really done, Andy? Ah, well, that's just the rest of the meeting, right? right. So, okay. Yeah. So, um, as Eli said, I'm Jolene Jansen, and um, I I work with the Clean Energy Districts of Iowa, working as um, kind of a new energy district startup coach. And I also work as the program manager for the Clayton County Energy District. Um, this is, that, that's where I live um, in Communia, which is an unincorporated area just south of El Cater in, in Clayton County. And Clayton County um, is the home of, and it really excites the people of Clayton County to know that they are the second energy district to have been formed or incorporated in the, um, in the nation. So, and perhaps the world, I suppose. This is a picture of, of um, me in 1978 with my girlfriends, um, the day that we graduated from eighth grade. Um, and we, I grew up in the north end of Dubuque. We had just graduated from Holy Ghost Catholic grade school. So we were kind of proud um, north enders, um, proud um, Holy Ghosters, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost Wildcats, and proud um, Dubuqueers. And it's morally, the reason why I show this, this image is because of the fact that that's my first memory of really being a part of a community. And I loved it. Uh, it, I, it I have such great fond memories of that. And, and in being a part of that, the more um, I felt positive about the community, the more that I wanted to support the community. And so it become, became this positive feedback loop. And I knew that I was going to spend the rest of my life working on building community. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit tonight about building energy districts. Um, it is a model um, that Andy um, has advanced and, um, and the group in Decora, and it has really, it does, it does make sense and it does work everywhere. And in the words of Helen, Kel Helen Keller, really alone we can do so little and together we can do so much. So um, what are the barriers to thriving communities? Um, that's kind of what I want to outline at first and um, talk about the fact that energy drain is a huge barrier to building up our communities. 
80% uh, of the millions of dollars our county spend annually on energy costs leave the local economy, and often these dollars go to benefit faraway investors of monopoly energy companies. And I think the word monopoly is really important. No one here gets a chance, uh, uh, gets to decide where they're going to buy their power. Um, and so that's, that's very important. And I tell this little example, and I think maybe this is a good time to put that in there real quick, is imagine a monopoly grocery industry so that the only place that you could ever buy your groceries is at the high V in your neighborhood. And you could not buy your groceries anywhere else. So in this recent um, piece of last year during the legislative season, we really um, worked hard and you probably heard about the sunshine tax and you were seeing commercials on TV about um, uh, pitting neighbor against neighbors, especially neighbors saying, You're pay I'm paying for your solar panels and that's a problem. So back to the grocery store and the Monopoly grocery store, store uh, example, if, if only you could buy your groceries from Hy-Vee, um, and, and so you had no choice, you couldn't go to Fairway, you couldn't go to this, anywhere else, you had to buy them from, your, from that neighborhood grocery store, and then imagine if they said to you, not only do you have to buy all of your groceries right here, you cannot have a garden. You cannot grow any of the food that you'd like to grow. And that's really the example that was being, you know, the, that legislation, the Sunshine Tax, and what that really was based on is just saying you have no right um, to produce your own energy. In fact, we're going to produce all of the energy. It might be, some of it might be clean, some of it might be wind, some of it might be sun, but we're going to produce it all. And then you're going to buy it all from us, and you're going to buy it from just us, and you don't get to shop for that. So that's the kind of idea of what this energy drain is and what, what it's really doing to our communities. Um, and then in, in addition to that, um, why a lot of you I think are here, is the disruption of climate change um, also um, from extreme heat, cold, um, wildfires, sea level rise, flooding, biodiversity loss, intense storms and devastating, are devastating our communities. So that's a lose-lose. So energy districts, as Andy was mentioning, uh, um, go from energy drain to energy prosperity and climate stewardship, this idea of green means green. Energy districts are stopping that wealth extraction and creating wealth retention. And energy districts stop carbon emissions and are creating climate stewardship, a win-win. So we've been, we've, this is a working definition. This is what we're using right at this moment. And this is what we put out on our fact sheet. But just to kind of go over it real quick, a clean energy district is a local institution that are currently incorporated nonprofits. Um, and they're defined by county lines. They create to, they're created to strengthen communities by leading and implementing and accelerating the locally owned clean energy transition. Fair access to locally clean energy is a win-win, generating community-wide energy prosperity and climate stewardship. So the definitions associated with that I think are really important that we use um, pretty intentionally with energy districts is one that they're, they're fair. And when we talk about fair, that means they're inclusive. They include everyone, especially those who can, are sometimes the most challenged. Um, local meaning us, that's where we're talking about those county lines. So um, while we do have an organization called the Clean Energy Districts of Iowa, um, these local um, energy districts are best, the people know best how to, um, to work and live in their own communities. And so best ideas are going to be local residents, local champions. Um, and then the clean energy is, like, like we've talked about, efficient and fossil fuel-less. These are where the energy districts are existing today, um, and I won't go through all of them, but those are some of the, that, the, the logos associated with them. We're here in Lynn County tonight. Andy talked earlier about the um, energy districts, or the, the Southern Water Conservation Districts, that there are one in every county in the United States, that 3,000 Southern Water Conservation Districts that formed in the period of about a decade. And so we envision that there will someday be an energy district in every county in the United States. So the first step to really organizing an energy district is some of the steps that you've already been doing, and that's to identify the local champions and, and find them and, and get them together and see if they're not interested in, in becoming a, um, forming an energy district. These energy district um, local leaders are often, um, they're obviously diverse, meaning they have various pro uh, professional backgrounds, they're young, they're old. Um, we, in, the, in this image here, you'll see um, economic development directors, you'll see um, firemen, you'll see 4-H yeah, leaders, you'll see um, uh, soil and water conservation commissioners, doctors, um, so, uh, local solar owners. 
all kinds of different people that are passionate about their communities and passionate about building their community through um, working with the Clean Energy District. But essentially, they we like to see that they live across the county and represent the entire area of the Energy District, that they're, they're, they're diverse, um, especially gender balance is always good at board tables, um, but essentially they're people that are willing to give of their time, their talent, and their treasure. So that after you've assembled a group and you've kind of got things um, organized, um, and, and one of the things that I like to say is that we are working on, we have a toolkit put together with resources so that not every energy district is having to reinvent the wheel. I should have said that back on that other slide. The energy districts that exist today, at the beginning of the decade, there was one. We ended the decade with eight, with just about 10 incorporated energy districts. And so, um, and several of them were formed just last year. So the energy districts are not having to go back to the drawing board um, each year. And, um, but essentially, once you've got this, these organized um, people together, then you start doing some programming. Um, and here are a couple examples of that. So really, um, low building community through energy districts, I like to say is as easy as screwing in a light bulb. In Clayton County, we have an initiative to put 5,000 LED light bulbs like this into the light sockets of Clayton County. And it can make that, it seems like that's just a silly thing and anybody could do it. Well, it does take some organization. You gotta, you gotta source the bulbs and then you gotta get them distributed and you gotta convince people to make the switch and to take an, a working light bulb out of the socket and put in an LED. That's, that's always a little bit of a sale. Um, but there's a reason why we should do that. It actually makes real economic difference in the county. Um, I'll just go through this real fast. Uh, essentially, this bulb will last 13 and a half years and it will cost uh, 14, almost four, $15 to operate over those 13 years. An incandescent, just like it, um, that provides the same amount of, of light, actually in the course of that same lifetime would, la would cost $98 to operate. So the difference is $83. So if you take 5,000 um, um, light bulbs and you put them out there and you try, put times that by 83.50, that's a $417,500 savings over the 13 years. That's real dollars that are not, no longer flowing out of the county but are staying in county. In addition, it's a 4,200 metric ton carbon emission reduction. That's the equivalent of 10.3 million miles driven by the Honda Accord that I used to get here tonight. This is a picture of Utana Ruff, who's the director of the Clayton County Food Shelf. Today we just delivered another 600 bulbs to the food shelf. For clients of the food shelf bring in their incandescent bulbs and then they, they walk out with a four pack of 75 watt LED light bulbs. So that kind of works easy and it's a, it's a real easy program to get going. We have several other swap stations um, throughout Clayton County. This is an example of the Green Iowa AmeriCorps team that's doing just crazy good um, throughout Northeast Iowa. This is the Winnesheek team. Um, this is an example, the, the work that they do is they put a blower door test, they do air sealing and that kind of thing, but they also do whole household LED transitions and they also put in water aerators and we can go on and on about the program. The bottom line is, is that's an example of the data points that they did just, that they've audited just in Clayton County since the existence of the energy district since 2016. And annually those households are saving about $140, that's on average. Um, but the total household savings each year, based on those um, inspection, uh, those audits that have been done, is $16,000 in the county, um, just because of the work that they did. And that's just the first step. And we can talk more about the, the next steps um, maybe in the panel discussion. We have programming for farm energy. Um, a lot of the work is um, teaching them about the, the concept of lowering overheads by generating um, clean, clean energy by using renewables. Um, uh, talking about energy efficiency and doing LED barn LED transitions. And then we connect them to NRCS programming, cost share programs that are available. Um, on Main Street, this has been a really, um, as Andy talked about, biz businesses, some of them are talk, talk about doing that, um, generating, um, uh, using, putting up solar panels, but before that, just reduce before you produce. We put on an LED workshop, and after that workshop, Talk to uh, my friend Jay Mosier here, who owns Mosier's um, Pharmacy on downtown uh, Main Street in downtown El Cater. He decided to put do an LED transition. We connected him with some LED um, electric contractors, and the total cost of the project to do his two storefronts um, at replacing 132 fixtures was twenty-four thousand dollars. 
the bottom line is is now that house uh, that that business is saving nine hundred and four dollars a month um, on their utility bills and the payback period for that project um, was ten was ten months just uh, almost eleven months annually they're saving ten thousand eight hundred dollars on their power bill that's one that's actually two businesses downtown Alcatar Iowa imagine that um, at, at a at scale and an economy scale. All right, so another thing that we do is we work really hard um, at working with non taxable entities, local governments, a small government, or it doesn't really need to be small, but local governments, including in encouraging them to either power their church, power their school, power local infrastructure with, with solar. Um, after a workshop that we put on um, in 2017, 18, um, the city of Marquette went right back to their, their board table, um, the council table, and decided to, after spending six months convincing all of the city council um, that this would be a good investment, they decided to solar power this one well, um, well number four in Marquette, Iowa, um, with a uh, 36 um, kilowatt system. The cost of the project was $76,000, but in 25 years, they're going to realize $173,000 on that investment. That's an 11% rate of return. Um, and every year, they're reducing their carbon emissions by 954 tons. So it's, a, and that's just one well. They decided to solar power that one well. It took several months, six, six months to convince all of the council to do so. Now they are actively pursuing um, solar powering their wastewater treatment plant, which is a big, um, which is a, a huge um, tax for the, or a huge cost for the city government, as well as their city hall and their um, transport state, their transport garage. So the city of Guttenberg is another river town in Clayton County. Um, the Green Iowa AmeriCorps team, again from Winnesha County, came down and helped us do just on 30 apartments, we did a little pilot project there. We just swapped out all of the LEDs in these two apartments, or these 30 apartments, um, swapped out all of the light bulbs with LEDs and put water aerators on. And as a result of that project, um, we, we, Guttenberg is now, those residents are saving 38 um, every year, um, almost $4,000 a year um, in energy savings and a 2300 or 23 metric ton carbon emission reduction. We also worked with them last year to put through a, um, a fair net metering pro um, policy. They have a municipal utility, which is a unique opportunity for local, um, for local towns to really um, grow their communities, strengthen their communities, um, by, um, because of the fact that they get to make some decisions on, on the price of the, um, of the utility, of the, the price of the electricity. So um, we helped them put fair net metering policy. So at the beginning of the year, they had one solar project in Guttenberg, and now um, I just talked to the city manager yesterday or a couple days ago, and they now have five solar projects. But we opened up the energy district helped open up the door um, in um, Clay, or in Guttenberg to solar. So we also work a lot with our local legislators. You'll recognize Representative Abby Fink now in the center of the picture. We have State um, Senator Mike Breitbach and our Representative Ann Osmussen. Um, we, we engage with them, we show, we take them on tours, um, we invite them to our breakfasts and are pretty in constant contact with them, especially now that legislature is back in session. Um, and then the third step to really sustaining an energy district is, um, is, or is to, to keep an energy district going is to go and fund it. And that's, the, that's really the biggest problem with energy districts right now. We feel like if we can get some momentum, get energy districts, um, in several more um, counties in Iowa, especially in these metro um, areas, that we'll get to that tipping point and we will um, get, the, um, get to our holy grail, which is to get that authorizing legislation through um, at the legislature. It might take another round of elections, but, um, and then maybe we'll get some of that financial um, resources that we desperately need to keep these going forever. So the last question is, is who's in? Um, and the, my mom the, uh, taught us the phrase, the unity of the community is the totality of the reality. <laughs> what a great quote, Julie. Yeah, it is. <laughs> OK, uh, I'm Craig Mosher. Um, and I live in Iowa City now. I spent what, 13 years in Decorah. Um, where I worked with the energy district there and helped get that going and um, learned a lot by seeing that process uh, get underway. 
Does it help if I talk into this real close? <laughs> okay. It's, it's kind of hard to stay by the microphone, microphone, I know. Um, so, let's see. I, um, I'm really interested in this because I moved back to Iowa City after I retired from teaching at Luther. And I had five grandkids there. And my grandkids and my students are inheriting a world that my generation has left them with. Um, and I have a hard time explaining that to my students and my, kid, my kids and grandkids sometimes. So that's a big part of the motivation for me. Um, I'm also really excited to see what happened in Decorah when people started really developing the capability to do this work and local contractors got on board and people learned the skills and we helped to develop the market with the energy district and that's a significant economic impact in a town like that and we can do that here in Cedar Rapids too. Uh, we're going to see uh, a lot more interest in contract among contractors in doing this work because we're going to build the market for it with our activities and that's going to stimulate the local economy and this is economic development you know maybe we're saving the planet but it's re it's economic development also and that's part of why we're here so anyway let me um, what I'd like to do is talk with you about what we've been doing in Iowa City as an example of what sort of needs to happen in an urban area um, as differentiated a little bit from the more rural counties that have, have been done previously. So there are some differences. Um, the Johnson Clean Energy District is about a year old. We started um, in the October, um, a little over a year ago. And we first in the spring we got incorporated. We did our 501c3 IRS status. Um, we formed a kind of a steering committee, a planning group to get it going. Um, we got a couple of small grants from Iowa City. Uh, it helps to have a political environment in Iowa City that's pretty supportive of some of this stuff. Um, so we've been working on a strategic plan. We've developed that. We held some focus groups over the summer with some of that grant support. Uh, talking to stakeholders and getting their advice about how to do marketing, how to do uh, public relations, how to do fundraising, things like that. Um, and we've had the good fortune to have on our planning group a contractor and a green architect. And they have been working with their clients as they do their regular jobs, talking to them about energy and about efficiency, and about the things that they could be doing as suppliers and contractors to move this whole agenda forward. And having those two folks involved in actual daily working with working contractors has been an important part of what we've been doing. And it, I think it's really beginning to build some interest among that contractor group, which is key to what we're, we're trying to accomplish. So. Uh, We've also been working with, uh, collaborating with the local Green Iowa AmeriCorps. We're fortunate to have one in Iowa City as well. Um, and that'll be a part of our sort of boots on the ground, as we call it, doing the work in people's homes going forward. Um, and Iowa City has a, a major climate action plan that was actually developed three or four years ago and has recently been kind of renewed and updated. Uh, you may have seen something about this in the paper. Um, so the city is kind of recommitted to, and they, they upped the ante a little bit on their goals. So Iowa City has pledged to, to the, the Paris Agreement standard of, of being carbon neutral by 2050. That's a big challenge. There are a lot of residential and business buildings in Iowa City that need to be upgraded in terms of energy efficiency, and a lot of renewable needs to get added to make that happen. But, but we'll do it. So we did not start uh, the way Winnesheet did with a large federal grant. This was the time of federal stimulus in 2007 and 8, when there was some federal money available, and that got Winnesheet off and rolling really quickly. So we've been uh, 
just getting it, as mentioned, a couple of uh, small city grants. Uh, but we've been working with uh, the city and the county both, um, where they both have sustainability directors and sustainability programs because of that political climate that I mentioned. So we're working both on uh, energy efficiency and on renewable development with those folks. The city's housing rehab programs are a prime candidate for this. So when they do housing rehab, they now have some requirements that energy efficiency be part of the planning for that. So the city's climate action plan that I mentioned, there's a commission, and one of our planning group members is on that commission um, and works with the city on that planning stuff. Um, the political climate, again, notice that you may have read the student strikers in Iowa City started last spring. Um, they, they were out of school every Friday afternoon uh, protesting about climate change. They got the school board to make some serious commitments and to begin looking seriously about electrifying the school bus fleet and doing some things like that. So then they went to the city council and helped do this new climate action plan uh, revision. Um, and they're now after the university to um, try to pressure the university to do some more work as well. So that really does help. And it helps, of course, having a city council and a board of supervisors that, that get most of this. Um, that makes a huge difference. We had a, a rally in Iowa City. You may have seen it in the paper. Um, Greta Thunberg was there. That was the largest rally we'd had in Iowa City in years. 3,000 people turned out on the streets for, for her to speak. And it is kind of remarkable to listen to that young woman. You know, just she lays it out in very clear language. There's a book now for speeches you can get and, and read them. Maybe you've seen the Time magazine cover and stuff. So, But I just love it when at the United Nations, she looks these diplomats in the eye and says, how dare you? You know, I mean, she gets it. <laughs> Some of them don't yet, but the time is coming. So, uh, I mentioned that we have a planning uh, committee person who's working with contractors, um, talking up this in the course of their daily work, helping those contractors kind of upsell their customers on this energy efficiency and renewable development. Um, the contractor who's on our, uh, on our committee is a uh, leader of the Home Builders Association, which is another group that's obviously very central to making this all happen. Uh, so we'll be seeing that happen. And working with the suppliers as well. So the uh, plumbing supply in Iowa City is now stocking uh, air source heat pump water heaters, which is a, a new technology that's available that they can now sell to customers. Um, and notice that those five new electrical contractors that Andy mentioned in, in Decora that were not there 10 years ago, not, not doing solar and renewable stuff 10 years ago, those represent jobs in a community like that, right? They're having to hire new people to do some of that work. And that's part of the way that we think we can sell this because you've got to sell this idea across the aisle, right? You can't just sell this as climate stewardship. It's not enough to say we're protecting the planet, but it's also economic development. And that makes a huge difference in making it politically feasible for people to do this stuff. So some of the similarities then um, between the rural and the urban approaches, um, we're, we're all uh, nonprofits. We follow the soil and water conservation district model. Uh, we're focused on energy efficiency and renewable energy both. Um, Building a local economy, um, but by doing the boots on the ground work of having the GIA team go in and uh, do this work, uh, we're buying those light bulbs from local suppliers to do that kind of stuff. Okay? And when the second and third step work gets done, where they hire a contractor to insulate their attic or um, put in a bigger furnace, a, a more efficient furnace, um, or maybe put solar on the roof, then that's uh, economic development and it's it's helping uh, stimulate that economy so so that's a part of what we do uh, also we do the public education um, and uh, we can talk more about that if you like their energy breakfasts their workshops their uh, various kinds of ways to do that um, 
and we advocate for public policy. So we work with the Iowa Utilities Board. Uh, we work with, as uh, Jolene and Andy mentioned, with state and local uh, legislators uh, and try to kind of move this all along so that someday we'll, we'll have a political majority to do this work. Uh, we're also part of, uh, all of us, uh, all the county energy districts, part of the state association of clean energy districts of Iowa. And actually that group has now begun reaching out to a couple of counties in Illinois, uh, one up in Wisconsin and some beginning talk in Minnesota. So this is going to spread. We're going to see energy districts develop nationwide eventually. And it all started here in Iowa. Okay, so um, Cheryl, do you want to take over? I mean, I guess this is a time for us to ask any questions mm -hmm. that we have of our panelists. So thank you very much okay. for providing that framework that we can draw from. Um, are there any questions that you all have? Um, I'm wondering, uh, I think all of you in Iowa AmeriCorps is involved in some way. How, once they're involved, does their work kind of change once they're part of a more targeted effort by the city or county to make residents more energy efficient? Or does it? Not really. It, I mean, it's still part of the Green Isle. We're still partners with CEEE at UNI, the Center for Energy and Environmental Education, right? And so it's still a Green Isle AmeriCorps program. Um, we at Winnesheek are the host for, for our team, and then our team also has been going, actually from the early days, outside of our county lines. That's a little different than most of the other teams that kind of stay in a, in a city. Um, so we've been doing that for years, and then as the energy districts, like our neighbors in Clayton and Howard, began starting up, well, there was another great local community contact, right? So they could get help the team get boots on the ground in the community. So, so in terms of the geographic scope, it's certainly broader, and the, and the new energy districts um, were sort of sharing the team. In terms of what they're actually doing, um, it, it's similar, it, it's consistent with the program, though we, because we're an energy-focused organization, which is different than some hosts, um, we've really tried to make it a more robust, especially in-home effort. So we have often done a broader scope of activities, we may get in more homes. We may have some different processes and procedures to maximize the energy savings and dollar savings per, per household. But it's still consistent with the program. Jolene, you want to add anything? No, not really. Uh, other than um, time will tell. I, I think the metro areas are going to have a hard, uh, easier time, excuse me, of using GIA teams or having access to GIA teams. Um, it's a certainly a, I mean, it, it is our calling card to have to offer these residential energy efficiency um, assessments. Um, so we're, we're kind of, I think it's a good problem to have that we now have so many energy districts and we want to be able to provide some similar common um, programming. Um, and so we've got some some work to do um, with GIA and with the CEEE to figure out how we can continue to partner and, and if, if there's not enough resource there, then we'll have to come up with some other ways to provide that kind of, um, it's a good problem. It, it's a good problem to have in that the awareness is there. It's a bad problem to have in that it, it's always a thing. Money does seem to be the limiting factor. So I mean, if we could, if, if money was not an option, then we would have all kinds of plans for making sure that we pr provided what the demand is right now and those are assessments and homes. So the GIA teams are sponsored differently in each county. Um, in Winnesheek, actually, the Winnesheek Energy District hosts the GIA team. And so that's a very direct relationship. In Iowa City, it's the city of Iowa City, Parks and Rec, that hosts it. Uh, here in Cedar Rapids, it's Matthew 25 that hosts it. Um, so th that's, that's different. And so the, the collaboration is a little different in each situation. Um, and Eli, I don't know, do you want to say anything about sort of what you do in terms of going into homes and the Energy sure. retrofit stuff? Uh, sure. So, what uh, Green Iowa does, and this is sort of all the teams throughout Iowa, we do free home energy audits, and so we run the lower door test. And so, we're finding areas in people's homes where air seems to be leaking out. And once we find those, we have a set of like, tests we do, and we have energy uh, 
Nice. We have audit coordinators who are more technically, uh, uh, they have more technical knowledge than myself as outreach coordinator, but they're able to convey to the homeowners on the results of the test and um, depending on how high the, or the results of the test, we may be able to additionally do a weatherization appointment. And so what we do at the weatherization appointment is some lights um, work, uh, like coffee windows, putting door stripping and uh, the doors and stuff like that. But the thing is, we have a non-competition um, like clause, so we, we can only do stuff that a homeowner would be able to do, but a lot of their audience, they are maybe elderly or disabled, and so like maybe they're unable themselves to do the work, that's why we're able to come in and do it, the work for them for free, but we can't do anything that like a paid contract would be able to do, so like we're very limited at what we can do, but we are able to like recommend like some people they can reach out to if they have to, like the money to like actually do like some real like insulation. <coughs> One thing we're doing in Iowa City is beginning to talk with the high schools, uh, shop programs, and with Kirkwood um, about the possibility of some of their students getting involved in doing some of this work because our, our GIA team is not going to be able to do the number of homes that are going to need to be done to meet some of the city of Iowa City's ambitious goals. So, so we're starting to look for other ways of, of doing that. And if we had the funding, we could you know, hire a contractor, you know, to do it. And, and maybe somebody would start a business doing this and we could hire them. A lot of contractors aren't going to want to do little jobs like this. Um, but maybe someday we'll actually have paid people, you know, uh, more than just the GIA team who are getting a stipend and so forth. So, I think one of the, and maybe it's obvious, but I think that the benefit of having an energy district coordinate these kinds of um, energy audits or energy planning services is the fact that we're not selling energy. And so it's that impartial objective. And our goal is to reduce energy costs for the members of our community. And so that makes sense. And so if we're creating a market um, for somebody to do energy efficiency work, that's great. But their goal is going to be to um, save, save that person money through um, energy efficiency measures. Yeah, one of the quick things that the, the teams do when they go in is that they give a report to the homeowner with the kinds of things that they could do next. Um, and they also collect data on every single light bulb that they changed and exactly what was done and then calculate the energy savings, the uh, energy bill reduction, the, you know, how much people will save on their bill, and the carbon emission reduction. So we're going to collect that data statewide and be able to document that, which is part of will help with fundraising and it'll help with sort of selling this politically as well. So, Eric? Um, in Iowa City, so there's the Johnson County Energy District. Um, what do you do that is supportive? Like, how, how do you do, since it's a separate entity, the Green Iowa Mayor Corps team, how do you support them? And with a small money, just two small grants and whatever else money you are able to gather, what do you do with that money? Okay, so um, basically we just collaborate with the GIA team because they're hosted by the city of Iowa City. Um, we don't have, we don't supervise them, but so what we do is we feed them referrals to, um, you know, help them market their, their work. And because our goal is to get as many homes done as we can in the city. And so we, we try to find people that want to do this. And in Iowa City, we're doing it through the neighborhood associations. So Iowa City has a whole system of neighborhood associations. Maybe that happens here too. Um, and, and that's a great way to sort of recruit people. It's neighborhood by neighborhood because people may not do what you, you know, may not change their behavior based on information you give them, but they'll change their behavior according to the research when they see their neighbors doing something differently, right? And so by working with the neighborhood associations, we can go neighborhood by neighborhood doing this work and either putting a, a green E in the window or a yard sign or something that sort of signifies to your neighbors that, that you're on board with this. So. Um, second question, everyone. Uh, the, the funding that you were able to get? Yeah. What's that? So we got a couple of small grants from the city, and that went to 
uh, get us incorporated and to basically run a series of focus groups with stakeholders. So we invited uh, bankers and media people and public relations and marketing and organizational developers to come and meet with us, as well as some local citizens, to just gather information about how we get this new organization started and to vet the strategic plan that we develop, things like that. The grant dollars that, that we've gathered um, go to, you know, kind of do some staffing, buy advertising, um, buy light bulbs, um, pay for our share of energy audits that, um, that we, that we um, need to, to pay for, travel, that kind of thing. So, um. uh, this is my question, I think, is a lot of example for Jolene. You uh, talked about a um, couple of projects, one I think you mentioned in Gothenburg, mm -hmm. where you were uh, <clears throat> going to some uh, rental properties, replacing light bulbs and, and shower heads, I think. Yep. So I know in some rental arrangements, maybe uh, certain utilities or all utilities might be included in the rent. So are you sometimes subsidizing these landlords or how does that uh, yeah. the benefit there? Yeah, so it, in that particular case, the, um, the, uh, the renters were paying their utility bill. And um, this was um, low income housing on top of it. And again, it is in a municipal utility. And so they, they were all for this project that this, the city was, the municipal utility was, um, which is also managed by the city um, council as well. Uh, and the landlords were really interested in it as well um, because they, they knew that their building would then be, in theory, a little bit more marketable, or both, you know, they, it's a more energy efficient. Um, and so they let us, they worked with us to get in the, let the GIA team come in. But the, the um, utility was really grateful for it because it was reducing um, what the bat, what were already probably bad bill payers, what they actually owed. So it was, it was good for the community. Let me just say one thing that the rental market is obviously one of the key issues here because rental housing typically is more leaky and so energy bills are higher there per household. Um, and yet you've got this whole problem that if the landlord is paying utilities, there's not much incentive um, to, uh, I mean, if the renters are paying utilities, there's not much incentive for the landlord to, to do this work. So uh, one solution is to get enough funding to make incentives for landlords to see it in their interest to do this. Another is to create a, a kind of, some kind of a certification program where a landlord would uh, make their their rental units more uh, energy efficient, and we would give them a certificate that they could then use to market those apartments to potential renters and say, you're gonna save this much on your, your energy bill because we did this work to make it more efficient. So in a sense, that's reducing your, your total rent plus utilities amount by this amount. So there, there are ways like that. Uh, we can maybe do something like that with real estate agents as well in terms of uh, home ownership if you had some kind of a certification program where they could market this eventually. You know? So things like that we can do in the policy arena uh, to kind of help move this along. But, but you're absolutely right, the rental market is, is key to this, this problem. I have a question about solar energy, so I'm not sure who gets this. Uh, my neighbor put solar panels on uh, their roof. And when I was talking to him, he said, but there's no storage capacity, so he gets benefits just when the sun is out. So I'm curious, is the no storage capacity actually all solar, or was that just that specific situation? Because without storage capacity, it seems like it's fairly limited, so that's why I'm curious. 99.9% .9 of solar that's installed is grid tied. So the customer is connected to a grid, has an electric utility provider. <coughs> client or co-op or whoever it may be or, or municipal. And in those situations, um, it's generally hooked up, at least in Iowa, with the investor-owned utilities under a tariff called net metering. And so in that case, the solar panels are producing 
whatever demand is needed at the customer side behind the meter is used first, and surplus actually then is fed back into the grid. So it's not lost, it's not you know, shut down production, it's fed into the grid. And, and then the customer gets a credit for those kilowatt hours on their bill. So of course then you Okay, so are you on the line? Uh, yeah. So we got five solar, and we'll on land and uh, Lion is a public utility in Lion in America and Iowa and uh, a lot of here. So your neighbor, uh, and I, I have a big one of the launch plan, how it is in the East of the So I have to check this stuff. Uh, so when I'm not using the energy from the sun, it goes right out of the grid to the line. And then you count that. And then at the end of the month, uh, I use more or use less. Uh, that that account either goes against my bill or I'm adding the account to me. They zeroed out once a year. So the case here, if you said your neighbor said where um, the uh, individual, where well, in some places people are on, on a, like on a co op, and I don't most of them except for a few exceptions, um, don't pay very much when you're generating more than you're using. So that's the case where the you know, sun shining. Only using 500 watts, but it's generating three kilowatts. That's all going to the co-op. They're only going to uh, pay a small, relatively small amount for their electricity. And every co-op has their own number. They're not required to have an energy. So that's a special, special case. But if you have a line from in America, then you have, they have to go on the meter. So far, so far. But that's actually another example of the. Relatively unique role of energy districts because we, at the very beginning, we didn't expect to do much policy, did we, Craig? <laughs> no. Craig was there. He was part of those initial coffee conversations. He was the founder of our district, and we really thought we were going to work at the community level. Yeah. But within a year or two, it became quite clear that policy, certainly at the state level, at the utility as regulator and state level, impacted a lot of what we wanted to do from the energy efficiency program to solar. And so, this policy of net metering um, is not at the goodness of utility hearts, it's a state policy. This has been required by the state. Um, the utilities tried for the first time in 2013, 14, 15, what, 14, 15, and 16 to overturn that. And that was one of the first dockets that we jumped into as a young nonprofit and said, oh, we got to do something about this. Well, what do we do? Well, how do you, you know, how do you, inter you become an intervener? You apply for standing. We did all that. We jumped into that case. In that utility board docket, of course, this wasn't just us. There were other interveners there. But that was the first time the regulators in Iowa had upheld net metering over the objection of the utilities. The utilities wanted to do away with net metering. They wanted to say, hey, whatever you feed back into the grid and give to us, we're going to only pay you a teeny little bit, you know, and, a low, and a low that's, that was his point to me, that is that very small bit. So that's where it was a longer-term investment than that is That is exactly the case. That's a, that's a, that's a an active tactic by utilities across the country to discourage customer ownership of net metering because it reduces the sales of their product. I mean, this is a universal. This is just it's happening everywhere. The next attempt by the utilities to do that was actually uh, a year ago in the legislature. If you've heard about Sun Sunshine Tax Bill, that was actually Mid American that, that promoted that, and they thought they had it in the bag, and it rolled right through. The, and what it would have done is essentially established new fixed charges and large part overturn that metering through implementing demand charges. So it was all about imposing new customers for solar owners so that your solar is of little to no value when you feed the grid. Obviously what you use on your side of the meter technically so far still belongs to you, but when you feed the grid, if, if half of your energy goes back into the grid, it doesn't have much value. And so that was actually defeated the legislature. And we were super active in that. All the energy districts actually a year ago, a number of them were active in that issue as well. The most recent attempt was the Alliant rate case, believe it or not, very few people. In this recent Alliant rate case that was filed in March and the ruling just came out, it's not even covered in the news, but there was an attempt in there to establish new charges for solar customers. The way they tried to do it in that case was say, we need to charge transmission fees because when you put money back, put energy back in our grid, you're using the transmission service. Wait a minute. No, you're not. There's a difference between the transmission and the distribution grid, right? So without getting into too much, 
99.999% of Iowa solar owners' energy doesn't go into the transmission lines at all. If it gets fed into the grid, it just goes to the neighbor. That's where the electrons go, okay? So there's no basis to the argument, but the, um, the power of the utility <laughs> to get reams of testimony in on an issue like this, and it would have significantly diminished the value of energy that Alliant Solar customers were feeding the grid and done exactly the same thing. Um, we defeated that. That was actually pretty significant. We put a tremendous amount of energy into that over the last eight months. And uh, so the utility board, that was an actual ruling that the utility board just ordered, Alliant, thou shalt not impose this fee. Mm -hmm. um, so, so does the technology not exist to store it, or is it too expensive, yeah. or is it because of the monopoly of the um, power companies that it has to go back to the grid? So, so batteries are there. You know, battery storage is coming along. And in 20, between 2012 and 2016, 17, um, just solar panels dropped off the price curve. So during that time period, it became really economically viable for many people to invest in this because the returns were good because the prices came down. Storage is just coming off that price, starting to come down the price cliff. So at, at this point, if you were to invest in solar plus batteries so that you didn't have to feed the grid, it would double your cost. In somewhere between five and ten years, it may only add ten percent of the cost, right? And then we're going to see it universally. We're already seeing battery storage everywhere. But the other part of that equation is, we shouldn't need to all be doing batteries. The grid is an effective battery. There's no technical obstacles. It doesn't cost the utility anything. It's actually a really robust way to manage electricity. Is to be generating it all over the place, not just the big big central power plants. So it works in all ways, except for the utility business model bottom line, and that's a struggle we really have to take on. One of the resources that's available to us as, as members of this utility energy district is the, the website that the Winterstreet Energy District has, which has a lot of this kind of policy stuff on it. So if you want to if you want to be an intervener on an I utilities board issue like we were just talking about, you can go to the website and get your talking points from there and write your own you know, note to the, to the IUB, and it's a, it's a great resource, and we can use this with legislators and so forth, so, so that's available. Which, amazingly, in this Alliant rate case, broke all records in Iowa, over 5,000 people commented. Yeah. This wasn't all just energy district, but no. we generated right. a lot of those comments. Right. Yeah, people so, are caring. Yeah. We're just keeping time in mind. Uh, let's take another question, or maybe two quick ones. And then we want to talk a little bit about steps to actually start forming an energy district. Uh, you want to? Back to the clean energy districts, I'm curious what the administrative support structure is required to make the whole thing work. You have a pilot, pilot is it all a volunteer board or any staff? Okay. So uh, we are, uh, each uh, county forms its own uh, incorporated uh, with a board. Uh, so we incorporate, we form a board, uh, and we apply to the IRS for 501c3 status so that we can receive foundation grants and donations uh, and give people tax deduction on their donations. That's important. Um, usually what we try to do is as quickly as possible, we try to raise the money to be able to have at least part-time paid staff. Um, in in Winnesheek, there are three paid staff, uh, I believe that's right. Um, and um, in Iowa City, we're paying a, a Cracker Jack student about 10 week, hours a week uh, to help us with some stuff because we don't have much money yet, but uh, that's one of our major goals is to be able to hire a, a, at least a half-time staff person. So we'll be doing fundraising. We've, we've been, uh, we got a nice uh, grant from uh, Hills Bank um, in Iowa City, and we're going to be going after the other banks now with that as starter. Um, but we'll also be applying for some more city and county money. And I'm hopeful that it won't just be grants, but that we'll be able to actually tap money in the city budget, which they've got earmarked for climate-related kinds of work. I think we'll be able to tap some of that as well. Um, I would say the same thing's happening in the rural counties. Um, I don't think there's another energy district that has anybody full-time on staff. Um, but in, like in Clayton County, we have I guess it's just about just short of a full time, three quarter between two people. Um, but I, one of our 
you know, as we established um, kind of at rapid pace last year, a few more energy districts just again to kind of get the momentum going and get the recognition. Um, we are now this year really working with these energy districts to, number one, a lot of the funding that they've all um, kind of um, been used to come into existence came through community foundations, with actually the community foundation of Mary Rebuke, um, lent some dollars um, from a national funder, Nathan Cummins Foundation. And then all of these counties are working with their local community foundations to, to actually um, fund some of the work that needs to be done. But we're really encouraging the energy districts that are coming up to put somebody on staff, at, you know, at least at a quarter time, mainly because it just gives to that viability, that validity, and also, I mean, somebody needs to do the work in between the meetings, otherwise it's just a bunch of people talking about what their passions are and it, the work doesn't actually get done. And this is community level, community engagement, and it does take um, someone to do that work. And it, so it is an awful lot of volunteerism. Um, even the people that are working and getting, collecting a little bit of a paycheck are, are doing a lot of volunteering. But we talk about board members giving of their time, talent, and treasure. Um, and maybe not in equal increments, but definitely being willing to give up their time, of their talent, and of their treasure as well. Do you have a question? Yeah, there is. I mean, it's still it's still a benefit over current grid electricity, cradle to grade life cycle assessment. Um, but it's there, and it's there even from solar panels because you got to man manufacture something. So, so there is there is that reality and everything, and it's really just a matter of um, what's the best path. You know, what's the lowest emissions that you can use. Now, as the overall grid gets greener, <laughs> we work on that too. You know, we don't. We have been in many dockets at the utility board, and every single time we say, look, we don't, we're not saying the large utilities shouldn't big, build large renewables. We've been talking a lot about big scale solar, which has not quite yet hit the news in most places, but there are really big solar already in the planning phases in Iowa, and it's going to be built this next year. Um, so we've always said we don't oppose that as long as the rules stay fair for the rest of us, as long as the utilities don't try and preclude and exclude everyone else, customers and communities, businesses and farms from, from doing solar. So really, it, we should not need all to build batteries. The grid, there are really good studies that show, and many grids around the world have already showed, that you can get to somewhere between 50 and 80 percent penetration of renewables with our existing system and structure with almost no storage. Well, we're nowhere near that. I mean, in Iowa, portions are near that. But as a major grid and regional grids, we're nowhere near that. You know, so we can just keep building and building and building renewables, large and small. And we're not, in, except for very rare circumstances, we are not stressing the current grid. So feeding the grid, again, with local renewables is a robust mechanism to go. And then at some point, as the grid starts to get saturated, we need balancing acts. and. You know, but gosh, look at te the technology, pace of technology development, and where we've come just in the last 10 to 15 years. And if the grid, say, at the regional or national level is 50% renewables in 10 to 15 years from now, I mean, that would be an explosion. That would be on a faster pace to get to 100% by 2045, you know, not even 2050. And what technologies are we going to have for storage in 10 years from now? It's not going to look anything like what we have now. I betcha. You know, it's going to be way beyond lower carbon footprint, much more cost effective. So it's the world is changing fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah push it down the road. It, it just couldn't be more true. And I think about when I first started learning about the energy district model and the way that we talk now. And it's not just because, you know, just by assimilation, you just start understanding it a little bit more. But things have just really changed just since 2015. The other thing that I think is that is important when we talk about batteries and how it looks today and how it looks is the electrification um, of transportation is going to probably make a big difference. I, we were just, I just shared an article with these guys today about just school bus fleets and the potential that they might have in battery storage um, for um, those peak demand times for utility companies. So how it, the business model is going to have to change for these um, utilities, these investor-owned utilities. 
um, they're not going to all of a sudden not not be capitalists, you know, trying to you know sell energy for their investors. But there's a lot of ways for us all to work together and use the grid as well. Like I said, electrification um, of transportation is a big part of that. So, so I, I'd like to kind of move us along a little bit because we'd like to end in 10 or 15 minutes so you can get to the debate if you're going to watch the Democrat debate tonight. Um, so I'm wondering what you think we need to do to make this happen. Um, what what kind of steps could we take here in Cedar Rapids and in Lynn County to get this rolling? Um, Maybe one question before that is who here has been a part of the initial meetings just to get to this point? So there's four of you that have been here, and the rest of you are five. So that's great. So um, yeah, so the, I mean, the next step really after this is like sitting together around a table and just saying, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to invest my time, talent, and treasure for a while in, in establishing an energy district. Um, and so that would maybe be a place where we could do a show of hands. I do have a question about that. What, can we talk a little bit, Craig, about the size of what that group should be? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about like the size of a group that would make sense? Because I envision that some people will be the doers at the table that are really those boots on the ground, and then there will be other folks that you definitely need to have in on the conversation, um, bring them along, hopefully have them at the start, but they're not going to be the ones to attend a meeting. Right. I think that's really a good question. And my experience has been, you know, working with Jackson County and Delaware County, Elmakee, Clayton, Dubuque, Howard. It, you know, first thing is, is the number maybe doesn't matter, but you should probably have at least five people. I think that you, you need to start with a board of five people. I think anything less than that um, get, makes it a little tenuous. Would you not agree, Andy? And then my other, my other, um, one of my slides there was to kind of talk about getting the diversity and that geographical diversity is important. Now, I don't know if it's so much of importance here in Lynn County, but I bet it is because I went to school here in Cedar I went to Co. and I, I mean there are a lot of there, Cedar Rapids is you know you know it's like Decorah and Winnesheek and Dubuque and Dubuque County but also growing up in Dubuque County there are a lot of other towns and they are part of the energy district and, and, and so having some geographical representation is sort of important as well our energy district in Clayton County we have about 10 towns of, of around a thousand people in it there's 20,000 people in the whole county and so we have representation all over um, and it and it really is important that we do so otherwise I don't I don't think we would have any forward movement um, so we have we have nine board members um, in, in theory I guess one of unfortunately one of our board members passed away um, last month but um, so we we try to have those nine, and that's been really a big advantage to have that. It hasn't been too complicated, and it's worked worked well. So yeah, and I would say you know a next meeting coming to it doesn't necessarily imply that someone has to sit on the board, right? I mean, this can be a process, a little bit of a planning process. You want right. a team of champions, yeah. and you might have champions that that are interested and involved in sort of coming to meetings who might not end up sitting on the board, and it's okay to take whatever time people seem to feel is necessary before actually incorporating the board to, to keep finding those potential champions. You know, if you think you really need someone from some part of the county or maybe you need a banker or, yeah, <laughs> you exactly, know, whoever, yeah. or an educator, whoever it may yeah. be. It, yeah. uh, in Joe Davies County, um, which is a county that I've been working with to get an energy district started, which is north, northwest Illinois, um, they, they had a, a meeting like this, um, and then they had uh, they had another kind of informational meeting, and now the, their third meeting actually was um, to just, they just said, okay, after the second meeting, how many people in the room think there should be an energy district here in Joe Davies County? So that might be something that this group of people might do, is just say, are you willing to say, yeah, I think there should be an energy district? And then are you willing to come to another meeting or two to talk about, okay, I'm, I'm in on an energy district, I'm not sure I want to be on a board, but maybe I can bring somebody else. I've heard this much, maybe I can bring someone else to that 
next meeting. So that might be a, a consideration that we would think about doing is maybe do a show of hands if you think there should be an energy district in Lynn County based on what you heard tonight. So, I mean, that's, yeah, that, 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 I mean, and again, that's not saying that you, you're going to make sure it happens. You're just saying that you think there should be one. So uh, Who took a picture of those? Yeah, right. So, <laughs> I, I will take a picture, actually, <laughs> for the record. We got a good one in Polk County, actually. Of the same thing. So yeah, if, if you think there should be an energy district, just raise your hand. Yeah. Thank you for the record. Look, um, we had a meeting just like this in Polk about a month yeah. and a half ago or yeah. so, um, and we had a nice turnout, and and people are meeting again and kind of moving forward and stuff. So, uh, so yeah, this is uh, it's kind of exciting. Uh, I'm glad that there's that much interest. Um, and again, I would just say that like in Iowa City. We don't, we don't even call ourselves a board yet. We're still kind of a planning group because we want to be intentional about selecting board members. And so it may be another few months before we actually identify formal board members in that. The, the people that are coming now are just w working on how to get this started. You know? um, so it's... Uh, and we do you know, certainly have the ability amongst us and the existing network to continue just helping on with whatever's needed. Jolene has essentially been our professional coach, <laughs> but she has limits too. But you know, one way or another, if there are gatherings to be had and it would be helpful to have somebody from the existing network yeah. come, you know, we'll we'll just continue to do that because that's why. I'm... Yeah, and I think I, I think you have some of you have some access um, to some of our resources as well. Thanks for the system that way. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we we we'll, we'll, we wouldn't just you know we've been pretty intentional about sticking with these um, forming energy districts. We have a, we have interest as well. I mean, we want to make sure that the energy districts are, you know, all about the same thing um, and, and that there, there's some consistency between them. So, shared values. Oh, Eric? I mean, I think of Bob just trying to understand or contextualize energy districts. It almost seems like it could be useful at some point to have like a table that shows all of ones that exist, kind of what they do. Um, the first thing that comes to mind right here is how would it be different or how would it support Green Iowa in Matthew 25? Yeah, I like that. that seems like yeah. the, the flagship thing that an energy district kind of can do that's, I mean, tangible and understanding and implementing yeah. helping homes. But kind of having a, a, a grid like that just to be able to look at the options and kind of understand what's out there. So send, send me an email and I'll send you a link to it. We, I put together for some reporting purposes a timeline oh. of the energy district's work just in this last year, but I think that it would actually come close to what you're talking about, is okay. where they are in the process of forming. And, and it's worth saying, mentioning too, even on the technical side, the boots on the ground, that Green Iowa is an important component of what we do, but certainly, for example, at, at Winnishi, um, you know, we go way beyond that when it comes to energy planning. Um, we, do, we do energy analysis with businesses. Yeah. We've done 70 plus farming agricultural operations. You know, you can get one single agricultural operation that saves a whole lot more money than a year or two's worth of, of Green Iowa if you're just looking at emissions. And that does nothing to diminish the importance of a Green Iowa team, one home by one home, right? So it's, it's kind of the universe of things. And it does, um, it really all adds up. And much of it too, you know, we are trying, we are really actively trying to build the, the toolkit um, in terms of templates and assistance available for starting districts to do things with low budgets and low resources, mm -hmm. right? So if there aren't big grants and staff, um, what are the things that are impactful that can be done with relatively small resources? And working with a, a Green Iowa team, if there's one, is certainly one of those. Um, but things like workshops and events, yeah. um, communications, there are, there are a lot of things that can still start to happen, even with that sort of a massive. And that I think is yeah. really important to get out of the gate that way. Um, we, when we started in 2015, or 16 is when we actually incorporated our, but before we actually even incorporated, we had a solar workshop. And I think we had 90 some people come to this workshop. And boy, did that get us on the map. And then the next thing we did was an energy, uh, an audit blitz, wh where we actually did, we went and got, I think, 15 homeowners that said, yeah, I'll take an energy efficiency audit. We gave, gave, it a, gave away the service, and then they told people. So 
just little low hanging fruit and then you know something like this buying 5,000 light bulbs and saying you're going to put them out in the county and you tell it let's send that press release out every few months I mean people people know the energy district um, in Clayton County so it, and it's it's I mean I, our budget last year is like twenty five thousand dollars you know I mean and that's was the most money I mean the first couple of years we operated on five thousand dollars so I mean it, can do stuff on low it budget. It is a momentum builder. Yeah. You, know, you don't have to do a, an, an energy analysis with every business mm -hmm. on a block. If you do one or two, yeah. <laughs> that's what happens. You yeah. know, neighbors know neighbors, visit the, people talk, and so you start you start things rolling, and then you, you build that momentum. So. One of the models here is the Solarize Lynn County and Solarize Johnson County project that some of you probably heard about, where the you know Moxie Solar installed a lot of solar for people um, with. Uh, nice pricing uh, with support from the uh, city and uh, county governments and so you know we're looking at doing that kind of thing in, in Johnson County and it, it can be done again up here in terms of energy efficiency uh, so well mm -hmm. before we run out of time yeah, one more I just want to make a comment on that right there um, just an idea for source of money so the projects in John, Lincoln County, Johnson County, Lincoln County, soon to be Johnson County again, I think turned out um, 600 kilowatts of solar and 1.8, one and a half megawatts of solar, and then here again, uh, 750 or so kilowatts of solar. I know that the organization that NRA has the ability, and there's one example of this, where I had a 250 kilowatt threshold, they were able to make a payment to an organization that so they have flexibility, mm -hmm. um, and that 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 had been at 250 kilowatts that they were comfortable giving ten thousand dollars away. Mm -hmm. And so all these programs far surpass that. And I know Johnson County is going to be doing another one soon. So this would be just the right time to say, can we get at least ten thousand dollars if you surpass? Cool. Whatever. So just a thought is the idea that we love solar, but we also know that not everybody can get solar, and so energy efficiency. Prime, and I know the city here and the county here will likely be making climate action plans that prioritize energy efficiency soon, so the time is going to right. Super. Okay. So before we go, just a show of hands, how many of you would be interested in meeting again to, to talk more about how to make this happen? Um, great. Okay. So, um, Maybe what we'll do is we've got an email list now. Uh, I assume everybody signed the list, and um, we can uh, send out a notice. So we'll try to pick a time for another meeting, and and we'll get rolling. Does that sound like a plan? Uh, so this is a good time of year to be doing this, and we'll we'll get at it. Um, but thank you very much for coming tonight. It's been really encouraging to hear people talk about it. We're going to make this happen. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. If you relationships with you. Did you get handouts? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And I would say help yourself to taking some treats home because yeah. I think they probably will throw those away. Yeah. yeah. Shake food.